Um, I should say that um, I'm new to New York. So I started in this position here at CADB, is, that's our short name for it, um, uh, best back in August. So I actually transitioned here from a center that I ran in Missouri um, about maybe eight months ago, right in the middle of, of COVID. So it was an interesting experience. Um, but my my background, I am uh, I, mostly a diagnostician by training. So I see a, a tons and tons of kids or have seen tons of kids for a question of autism or something else that might be going on that a parent might want an answer for or that individual might want an answer for and specialize in doing the types of assessments and, and looking at, at uh, different symptom presentation to see if it meets criteria for autism or not. Um, I do a ton of research as well. So my research ranges from new measures, mostly what we call phenotyping, which is trying to figure out like how different presentations of autism might look in different people. Um, and so I published widely in that field as well. Um, and I'm a trainer, which means I go around the country um, and help other people understand autism and also understand how to do what we do in terms of diagnosing it. So love, by the way, thank you for sharing your Thursday evening with me. Uh, it is Thursday, right? Yeah, Thursday evening, so I appreciate that. And I also wanna thank Janet and the Greenberg Public Library for having me come speak. Um, happy to answer at the end any questions that might come up. Um, whenever I give these talks, there are usually are a ton of questions. Um, and the reason why we find there, there tend to be a lot of myths about autism, misunderstandings about autism, things have changed in the world of autism. Uh, if you think about like, I know my wife and I watched this show, The Good Doctor. So like autism is prevalent in the media and presented in so many different ways that that it, it, it makes people form opinions about what autism is and what it might not be, um, that at least I can speak from my own experience and from my own uh, kind of work to tell you kind of what we think. So what is autism? And so the nature of this talk we're gonna go through is just what is autism in, in the most basic way, um, but also like what do we do these days to um, help address whatever, how do, how do we support people who have autism? What, what do we do to help support them in any way? Um, so autism, it's called a spectrum disorder. And we'll go into that more lately, but it really is this recognition that it's not just one thing and that people with autism don't present one way. Um, but we do know for a fact that it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. That means that we know that, that it affects how the brain works, um, uh, sometimes in a really good way, sometimes in ways that, that are more challenging for a person. We know that it occurs very early in life. Um, so basically you're born with autism. Uh, you don't catch it when you're four years old or five years old, um, you're, it, it, you have a genetic predisposition for autism. And because of that, it has developmental consequences. So it affects a person's development in many different ways. It could be language, it could be motor stuff. Um, but the way that we define autism is in two main, what we call core areas. And those areas are what we call social communication and then restrictive and repetitive behaviors. And I'm gonna go into a lot more depth about what those two things are. But what's interesting is these days you hear like just so much about autism and, and we really have identified it as a spectrum. Um, and there's all kinds of interesting stuff written out there where like you have high functioning autism or low functioning autism. And to be quite honest, um, for, for those of us um, in the field and, and those people I talk to who have autism, they, they don't like that because it, it, it suggests a very linear path of autism. And autism is anything but linear. So like just the range of different skills and strengths and challenges that a person may have are all over the place. Um, so it really is a spectrum of symptoms that a person presents with. Um, and those symptoms can vary in severity. Um, they can vary in how many of those symptoms they have. They can vary over time. So the same individual doesn't have those same symptoms over time. And two different individuals um, who both maybe have a diagnosis of autism can look completely different. Uh, which is, again, why it's such an interesting world um, in the world of autism. It's because no two people are the same that have been diagnosed with it. I love this slide because it, it conveys a lot of information in one place. Um, the first is, there, and, and people might react to this, or there is no medical test. There's certainly no cure for autism. Um, not that we want there to be a cure for autism. But there's no, there's no test for it. There's no biological blood test or something to say, is there, do you have it? So we want to get that out there because a lot of people ask those questions. But the next, I think, couple points are really important to us. It's like, this is something very significant. Um, you know, the research shows that it costs a family at minimum or on average about $60,000 a year when they have a child who's diagnosed with autism. 
it's kind of an um, equal opportunity across all racial and ethnic groups, meaning it, it, it has the same prevalence in all racial and ethnic groups that we have now looked at. And it's very common. So when you see that graph to the right, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, back in 1975, it was only one in 5,000 kids diagnosed, but now it's actually one in 54. So what the heck's going on here? You know, like, why is it just keep on getting bigger and bigger? Is it, you know, something in the water? Is it like some, is it like the pandemic? It just keeps on spreading? And the answer is no. Um, autism has, like the way that we define autism, I should say, has been around for as long as we know and has the incidence of it has pretty much, we think, been the same across history. Um, what we have done though, which I think is very significant, is before the way that we define autism was like a bucket this big, a very small bucket. So only the most severely presenting kids or adults, the ones that have the most severe or significant symptoms are put into that bucket. But now our bucket's this big. So we've expanded our bucket size really big in an appropriate way. So there are people who have challenges and difficulties in certain areas that we recognize for many different reasons come from what we are now calling autism. And so what happened is we've expanded the diagnosis and that has created this explosion in the number of people that are being diagnosed with it. Um, but as you, there, there is, we're gonna go through a slide, there's some hints that there are some environmental effects, uh, but not causes of autism. And we do know for a fact that um, it's a genetic disorder for number one, just by the, the boy to girl ratio. I mean, there are many, many more boys diagnosed with autism than girls that are diagnosed with autism. And just a, a quick aside, that's true of many types of um, other like problems that we study, whether it be learning disabilities, ADHD, other things. It's, it, boys tend to have a higher prevalence rate than girls in a lot of different areas that we look. So the DSM-5 that you see written up there, this is um, a document that we use that defines the symptoms of autism and every other what we consider a mental health disorder. Um, and by that, I mean like, I put it this way, like when, if you have anxiety, we all have anxiety, we all have sadness, we all have symptoms that might be associated with autism. So the way that you get diagnosed with anything in the DSM is it has to impair your functioning somewhere. So I like to be clear about that too. So this isn't, you know, a lot of us feel different symptoms of many different things, but you won't probably get diagnosed with something until it actually impairs you in some significant portion of your life. So the way that the DSM-5 talks about autism and defines it now um, is that it's a deficit in social communication and social interaction. And I'm gonna go through those, but you need to hit all three of those criteria. And then you have to also show these restricted or repetitive or stereotype patterns of behavior. You need to have two or of four of those. But I'm gonna go through what those are and what those mean just to be kind of really clear how we think about autism and how to diagnose it these days. So the first area are these um, deficits in social communication. And there really are, there are three of those, three parts to the deficit in social communication. The first one is a person to be diagnosed with autism has to have true deficits in their ability to engage in social emotional reciprocity is what we say. So what's kind of cool about the, the DSM is it gives us anchor points. So it could be as minor as just having difficulty knowing how to approach other people and engage them failure and being able to have a back and forth conversation on the more kind of, as it gets more severe, it might be this reduced sharing of interest or emotions all the way to, I think what we think of as more a classic presentation where you have the, the child who is, sits up by themselves in the corner and doesn't initiate any social interactions at all. So there's kind of a, you can already see even within this dimension, there's already a range of different ways that people can present. The second area under social communication is deficits in nonverbal communication. And you've heard all the sayings like 90% of how we communicate is nonverbally. Um, I don't know if that's exactly true, but nonverbal communication is a big part of what we do. Um, you know that by talking on the phone versus watching Zoom versus being in person, the nonverbals are huge to be able to see. So again, the range for that is, um, so there are people who don't make eye contact when they talk to you, but they still talk and gesture. Um, so abnormal eye contact is a big piece of it. And that doesn't necessarily mean a lack of eye contact. That just means that you don't use your eye contact to modulate your social interaction. Um, but it's also the ability to use and understand facial expressions. That's actually one of the biggest ones that we see that lasts throughout a lifetime is they don't have, you don't have a, as big of a range of facial expressions and you don't interpret facial expressions as well as other people do. Um, 
but it could also be other gestures and other types of things. So the nonverbal piece has to be there as well. And then deficits in the ability to maintain and develop relationships. So this could be as simple as knowing how to act when you go into certain social contexts, like, you know, like being able in a place of worship, probably being more quiet and respectful. Um, or it could be engaging in play, knowing how to play with another peer imaginatively or not. Um, but it's also just making friends, knowing how to make friends and be with friends. By the way, this is where one of the myths are, because a lot of people think, oh, if you have autism, you don't want to have friends and you don't like people. So not true. So not true. Um, it's just sometimes they have more difficulties understanding how to engage in a friendship and how to engage in the back and forth with regard to that. I always like to stop here too, because it's, it's interesting with all those symptoms I just gave you, you can understand why people are like, well, gosh, you know, I had a professor in college who was like that, or, you know, my uncle Joe is like this. That doesn't mean you have autism. Um, to have autism, these things have to be present and impair your functioning. And that's a, that's a big if. And the second area we talk about is restrictive and repetitive behaviors. And for this, you need to have two out of four of these. And I think these are the things that people think about the most when they look at autism. It's like, so if you see a person you know, flapping their hands or moving their hands in a very specific way um, that might strike you as a little bit different, um, those are called stimming. And that's what uh, kids who have autism or adults have autism often engage in or can engage in. But when they're younger, it could be as simple as lining up toys or just being object focused and just looking at an object over and over. Um, another one is engaging in echolalia, which is very specific, but it's, it's repeating what someone says right after they say it without any semantic or language reason. So it's, it's, that one is much more specific to autism. Um, another one is idiosyncratic phrases, um, which I love too, because it's, it's not, again, it's not necessarily anything that's, that's bad or it actually could be quite poetic. So we had um, a, a young child, young, seven years old, who whenever he started to feel anxious, he would start to rock a little bit and say, it seems that Thanksgiving is upon us. It seems that Thanksgiving is upon us. And the reason he said that was he watched an episode of Bear in the Big Blue House. And when I think it was the mom was getting ready for Thanksgiving, she was running around saying that, being very anxious. So this young boy then translated that that was his communication for whenever he started to feel anxious. He would just say that entire phrase. That was what we call an idiosyncratic phrase. I think one of the more common ones that we hear or see in, in people who have really high verbal skills with autism is they engage in, um, it's often be ter been termed as like little professor speak. They sound like professors when they talk because they're, they're kind of flat, they're kind of didactic and they use very big words. And again, nothing wrong with that. It's just not what we see in usually typical kids of that age. The second area, which actually out of all the areas probably has the most impact on schooling, on interactions at home is this one. And when Leo Connor first wrote about this in the 1940s, he actually identified this particular area as well. We call it insistence on sameness. Um, and again, we, if you have children or you know children, you know a lot of children do this. Um, they might have a tantrum or a meltdown if they don't get their way. Well, think about that times a thousand. So um, being able, we had a kid who would have meltdowns, not just tantrums, but meltdowns if you deviated on their route to school. Like you had to drive a certain route in terms of streets, which this person knew, this kid knew. And if you didn't do it, he would have a complete meltdown. Or if you move a toy from one place to the other, they would have a complete meltdown. So again, I'm not just talking about minor frustrations or, or, or even little tantrums. These are like meltdowns. Um, but, you know, as they get less severe, it could mean just verbal rituals or, or black and white thinking, not being able to think except for very rigidly. Um, so you see the little boy in the bed who lined up his toys. And if with this one, it wasn't the lining up the toys, it was if you moved a toy, he would have a complete meltdown. The next one is restricted or repetitive behaviors that are, have to do with circumscribed interests. This is one of my favorite ones because I have them myself and um, have done a lot of studying about these. Like, where do these come from? And again, if you think about it, I put Thomas the Train there because every kid likes Thomas the Train. I mean, that's why we have Thomas the Train, right? Because every kid likes it. But this, again, like many things in autism, is that times a thousand. So it's like the only thing they will play with is trains. The, and it has to be Thomas the Train. They have Thomas the Train plates and wallpaper and bedspreads, and they seek out Thomas the Train. It's all they talk about is Thomas the Train. So it becomes 
very circumscribed in their interests where, you know, a lot of kids have many circumscribed interests actually up to the age of five, and then they start to broaden into other areas. And those other areas are often very socially appropriate. Um, kids who end up having autism often don't broaden out and their interests are not very typically socially sharing. They can be, but not often. Um, I, I had another kid who was into presidents. That's our second president, if you didn't know that. And he could name every president, um, how old they were, their term, um, their weight, when they died. I mean, he knew everything about presidents you could ever imagine. And he was eight years old. Um, so again, impressive, but not typical. Oh, one last thing is on this area too, is what we call um, odd or unusual interest. So these are the kids who um, like, for example, vacuum cleaners, or um, I had a kid who loved air conditioners. So that's all he could talk about. That's all he loved. And he could tell you everything about every air conditioner he passed um, on, on the road while you're, while you're driving with him. And again, that's amazing, um, but not exactly um, typical. You don't usually see many kids of that age being able to do that. And then the last one is what we call hypo or hyper reactivity to sensory. So these are sensory things. And sensory is a really interesting area because people just run with this. It's like, they think everything's sensory. And they're right. Um, we experience the world through our senses. But again, like everything else I just talked about, this is taken to the extreme. So these are kids who, for example, don't feel pain um, or kids who um, will cover their ears and run out of the room just if you flush the toilet or if you have like a sound that doesn't bother most people. Or um, we had a kid who would lick everything. So he would walk around licking the table and the armrest and even the floor at one point um, or peering at things and, or watching water fall um, out of a faucet for an hour. So that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about, which is a little bit different again than um, that we see in, in populations that don't have autism. And just to throw this out here, because this caused a, a, a kind of a big uproar when we changed from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5, because there used to be these categories, autistic disorder, Asperger's disorder, PDD-NOS, they've all collapsed now into what we call just autism spectrum. Just acknowledging that, yeah, those might all exist, but they're all under the same umbrella. They're really not different things. They're just different presentations of autism. I like this slide too, because, you know, impairments is, is, is maybe a, a harsh word, but they, they really are when people come with the core associated symptoms of autism, they often have impairments and or just challenges in some of these other areas. So whether it be um, depression or anxiety, for example, psychiatric comorbidity, um, the rates of suicide are much, much higher in adolescents with autism than, than the populations that don't have autism. Um, we have a much higher rate of problems with being able to um, express themselves intellectually. So they have intellectual disabilities, um, problems in adaptive skills. So one of the most interesting things to me is I worked with a couple um, young adults who had autism and transitioned to college and they were brilliant. I mean, they had like 150 IQs. They're incredibly smart. And yet both of them for different reasons dropped out of college in the first or second semester. One of them because he never unpacked his bags because no one ever told them to. Um, and the other person um, didn't know how to work a GE washing machine because he had a Whirlpool at home. And it's just fascinating because like these super smart, but these are adaptive skills that they had a real struggle being able to, to figure out. Um, another one is medical conditions. They can have seizure disorders, GI problems, and just behavior problems, aggression, self-injury, those types. Um, and just to throw that out here too. So the range of autism is, is very, very large. You know, we have kids who um, can't speak at all, they're completely nonverbal to ones. I had a, a young man I worked with who was a, a radio show talk host. Um, we had a, a girl who injured herself so much, she actually bit off her own tongue. Um, but then we have others that, that are, don't have any behavior problems at all. So you really do have this full range. And that's kind of what this shows too. If you had to move it into a diagnostic category, you know, often these, these kids are diagnosed with ADHD or depression or OCD or other types of, of medical disorders um, with the hope that they can get some type of, of help and support in those areas that they have. So this slide is from a psychiatrist that uh, is here at, at Cornell um, and Columbia University. And the only reason I put it up there is just to show you how complex this is. So um, not only do we have the core autism symptoms in the middle, but then you have all the genetics that we're trying to figure out. It, the reason why we're looking at genetics, by the way, is it's just, we're, we're, we're seeing it at kind of the same path we saw in cancer. 
So if you think about cancer in the 50s and 60s, we, we knew what it looked like at the end stage and everyone looked like that sort of. Um, the problem is, you know, not the problem, but the more we did research, we found out that there are many different genetic causes of cancer that led to a certain type of cancer that then could be treated or targeted or supported in different ways. And that's kind of where we're at with autism right now. Autism is, is just the behavioral endpoint. What we know though is we're discovering in many cases of people who are diagnosed with autism, there are, are genetic differences um, that have different outcomes associated with them. So, and by, by knowing that, just like in cancer, you can say, okay, if it's this, maybe we can support this person with this type of treatment a little bit differently. But there's differences in medical stuff and the biomarkers they show, behavioral stuff. So it's just, it's an incredibly, you can, you can see now why there's no one person with autism that looks like another person with autism, because you can vary on any one of those domains and the core symptoms themselves. Okay, so in terms of behavior difficulties, that's where a lot of our kids, you know, have a lot of difficulties, whether it be in school or at home, um, and they can be very extreme and hard to manage for families and for the individual. So they're certainly at higher risk for behavioral problems. Um, again, have worked with many kids with autism that engage in aggression, hitting, kicking, um, both parents, siblings, um, and self-injury. I, I mentioned the girl who bit off her, her tongue, actually. We have kids who have you know detached their own retinas from how hard they hurt themselves, um, banging their heads on the ground, engaging in self-injury, having calluses for how often they, they bite themselves. Um, but also just be very disruptive. You can imagine how in a, in a classroom or in a, in a restaurant, um, it, it just is hard to manage. Um, and again, the behavioral difficulty, I don't even know, I wouldn't necessarily call this a behavioral difficulty, um, only in the sense that parents think about it this way sometimes because it affects how other people see their child. Um, but they can also talk too loudly when they're distressed or make inappropriate vocalizations. For example, we had a person who would go around like just telling people if he thought they were overweight or not because um, he didn't understand that that necessarily wasn't okay. Um, the largest cause of death in autism um, is drowning. And a lot of that is because over 50% of our kids who have autism elope, which means they leave the home and they're not, even down to the younger ages, and they wander and they're drawn to bodies of water and they end up drowning. Uh, it's one of the sad things you probably have read about it. You know, it, several of these have hit the news in the last um, several years. Um, so we actually work with first responders and encourage parents to do the same. So that if your child does elope, um, they know kind of where to search first to keep the child safe. So we have learned over the years too that it's super, super important to screen for suicidality. Because what we do know, like for example, the study in 2015 in Sweden where um, there are almost 10 times more likely as adults with autism to um, die by suicide, which is absolutely huge. Um, and we also know in other studies that uh, suicide ideation, I mean, just thinking about how to kill myself um, is much more elevated in clinical samples, means samples that come to us because they need help, um, which might not reflect the population of everyone out there who has autism, but still very, very high. So we need to screen for it. Um, the problem is like people with autism, often one of the, the defining features is they don't communicate well. So oftentimes they can't tell you what's wrong and they, or they don't express themselves in ways that are accurate in, even by their own admission. So it might be hard to screen for suicide if, if they had difficulty letting people know. Now, a lot of people ask about environmental factors, um, you know, like what causes autism, you know, parents, are mortified, like, oh my gosh, it was that third cup of coffee I drank in the first trimester or um, a medication that I took. So just so you know um, that we really do want people to feel, okay, it, it, you're born genetically with it. Um, so there could be risk factors, just like anything else, that increase the risk of, of autism. Um, so we know increased paternal and maybe even maternal age, um, having to do the fragility of the DNA might contribute to the risk of having autism but not necessarily causal, if that makes sense. Uh, we also know that premature babies and low birth weight have a greater risk of having autism. What we don't know about that, though, is what's coming first. Is it the, the genetic issue that's causing autism causing the prematurity or the other direction? Um, you know, most studies that we've looked at having to do with environmental factors like pollution or toxicities just haven't found much. Um, there was one study, I think, in California that did show along the highway a greater rate, rate of, of autism. They thought might have to do with pollutants, but they, they really don't 
again, what we find in most genetic disorders is you have a genetic disorder, so you have the predisposition. And then we all know in every genetic disorder, your environment does play a role, it plays a role in how it might manifest, how soon it might manifest, or and I think that's what we're seeing in, in autism as well. But we, we do want to put it out there in, in a very strong way that we do know that vaccines do not contribute to the risk of autism. This has been studied so many different ways. Um, and if you know the history of why this came about, um, I think my one of the people I worked with said it best, it's, it's easy to scare people, it's hard to unscare them. And so there's a lot of, of research, a lot of money looked at looking at new vaccines and, and there's just no evidence of it. So in terms of the genetics, just to like kind of show you why we, we think, actually um, autism is considered one of the most highest um, inheritable disorders um, that, that we look at. Meaning that if you have a family history of, of autism, there's a much higher rate of, of heritability with regard to it. So we know this from many different studies. For example, in twin studies, we know that um, there's a much higher rate if in identical twins up to 90% compared to fraternal twins, only five to 10%. Um, so if you look at that one meta-analysis, which is a big study, looks at a lot of studies, that about 93% of the risk of autism is heritable. Um, but again, the environment can play a role, but up to nine, 75 to 95% about um, is heritable. Um, and again, what we do know too, that if you have one child with autism, you're, the risk of you having another child with autism also goes up. So up to about 20% greater chance. What's interesting though, we, you know, from years ago, we're like, what is, we're, hope, we're hoping that there was like, we could figure out is it, what's the single gene that causes autism. What we know is it's not a single gene disorder. Um, there are single gene disorders that like fragile X, tuber sclerosis, Timothy syndrome that have autism associated with it, but they're not hundred percent penetrance, meaning like not everyone with fragile X has autism. It's just like much less percentage. Um, so we know they're associated, hitting the same pathways, but not necessarily causal. Um, so what we did find though, is that there's all these different, diff we've learned so much last five years about genetics, um, even genetics and autism, that there are all these different things. We've, I think we've identified now up to 40% of the cases um, of autism, we know what genes are involved. It's not just, it's called a polygenetic disorder. So it's not just one gene, it's often many genes and pathways and what we call epigenetics are involved, which are genes that turn on and off based on your environment. So it, it's, it's very complex. But what it's telling you is that what we're defining as autism is just the behavioral endpoint. Um, and that's what we're diagnosing is the behavioral endpoint of all this different stuff that you're seeing. So what do we do? Um, like at our center, what we truly believe in is the best way to support people who have autism um, is, is through what we call evidence-based treatments. Meaning I only wanna use treatments that research has shown work. Um, you know, if you Google treatment for autism, I think like over 450 treatments come up um, and because one person did it and there's a testimonial. And, um, and then, by the way, I, if I had a child with autism, I'd try everything to see what would work. Um, but what we do know, what we recommend are things that we do know have evidence behind them that are working. And that's what you see listed there. Those are all treatments that have been shown through research to have evidence, strong research showing that they, uh, that they work. So almost every single one that you saw out there that did work has a behavioral component behind it. And that's why I want to spend a moment talking about because um, if you think about how do you treat autism overall, we really do think that it should be comprehensive, goal-driven, meaning like it's not like like something else where it's like, oh, we just want to like stop something. It's not. It's like, okay. Um, for example, I have the, my, one of my good friends has a child with autism and he's a, actually a good friend of mine. And the young, young man is like, I don't, I don't want to get rid of my autism. I, I like my autism. Um, what I want to get, actually, he said it differently. He goes, I, I am autistic. I love being autistic. But what I want is I want help in like getting a girlfriend. <laughs> I want help getting a job. So not unlike many of us, it's like, okay, how can we help where we, how can we shore up where we have weaknesses? And that's what our treatment approach to autism is. Like, if you have a child who's, or a young adult who's been diagnosed with autism, what challenges do they have? And then how can we actually approach them? So it have to be evidence-based, geared to their needs, goal-driven, I mean, like, what is the goal we're shooting for here? Like, or do they want to be better at doing interviews? Well, let's help them. And what we found to this point, um, again, there's no medications that we know for helpful for the core symptoms of autism, 
But we know the, that almost every single evidence-based treatment that sh has been shown to work has behavioral principles behind it that work. And we know that they work the best when they start very early with the kids. We, that there's all the evidence points in that directions. We do know like in, in for, it's just frustrating for me in the field um, that's like, okay, so you know, if they're in middle school or, or even high school, what do you do? And what we found is social skills group help, social language groups help where we do, um, we have groups with young adults with autism that are learning how to date, for example, and they want just help being able to practice that. Um, but there's just less evidence that they're as effective as these other behavioral treatments are. What we do know is there's no medications right now that treat the core symptoms of autism. Um, what we do know is that there are co-occurring symptoms that we do have medications that do work and have been approved. So if you have a child who has a great deal of agitation or irritability to the point that it needs to be medicated, then we do know two medications that have been approved to do that. ADHD is a hard one. A lot of our, ki a lot of our kids have ADHD symptoms um, that may or may not be a part of the autism. It could be something separate, um, but it could be also just wrapped into their autism diagnosis. So the same medications that we use for ADHD, we can prescribe for autism. The only problem is they're just not as effective, quite honestly, um, and how to, to, how to juggle them and work with the families to see what works the best. Um, I would highly suggest going to a specialist for that. But we do know when we do the, our large studies, we were involved in a large study with um, the Simons Foundation where we looked at over 25,000 kids. The, 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 the sample now is over 100,000 people in it. Um, where we know that over three fourths of them have received um, or are on some type of medication. And um, a great m proportion of those are taking multiple medications. So medication use amongst people with autism is, is very, very high. So why this focus on behavioral treatments? Because we know they're effective um, in reducing challenging behaviors, especially. And we know that the early intervention is better. And we know no medication works. So really the only kind of course at this point is, is behavioral. And it, if you haven't heard of, of the term ABA, it stands for Applied Behavioral Analysis. And um, there's, a, there's a lot out there on ABA. Uh, ABA has been around since the 1950s, actually. It wasn't even for autism originally. Um, and I think it's taken on a life of its own in terms of a term. So what I like to do is just explain what ABA is, but then actually broaden people's thinking about it. Um, so it really is, you know, people like in ABA to, there were some people who used in the 70s that actually used it in a very a specific way that I don't think myself was appropriate. So it's gotten kind of a bad rap because of that. But what we think about ABA these days is it's an umbrella term. It means many different things. And it's really just a systematic way of applying principles of behavioral science. And the reason why, like when people say they're against ABA, um, to broaden thinking about it um, is if you've ever, for example, praised somebody for something, you are actually using ABA. If you actually, like with your children, if you actually engage in any type of, of trying to extinguish a behavior to make it go away or positively reinforcing a behavior to make it happen more, you're engaging in all the same principles that ABA does. All ABA does is, is move it to more systematic and gathering data. Um, and again, it's, it, if you, it has evolved over the years in amazing ways, um, because it, you know, if you watched us do, we don't actually don't we use a different type of therapy that's based in behavioral principles. It just looks like you're playing with the kids. There's no negative stuff. There's no punishment. It's all just playing and positive reinforcement. So you watch. It's like, wow, God, how why are they even doing it? They're just having fun and playing. It's but they're doing very specific things to positively reinforce certain behaviors. Because we know if we want to increase a positive behavior to teach a new skill or to promote generalization. Um, it's just what what everyone does in parenting, basically, but it extends it to the realm of almost science with regard to how they do it. And just a plug too. So, um, you know, I used to work in a severe behavior disorder clinic, but these are the kids, which I already told you about, that are so severe and young adults that they're injuring themselves, um, hurting themselves, hurting people around them, and the, they themselves and the families are at their wit's end. They don't know what to do. Um, so they bring them in and it, it is, we use the same techniques and it, it, again, there's nothing, there's no punishment. There's just extinguishing bad behaviors, but what you have to figure out first is why people are engaging in the behavior. So we had a, a young adult, 16 or 17, who was engaging in, for the first time in his life, very significant self-injurious behavior, hitting himself so hard, he was causing bruises and stuff. No one knew why. 
Um, so we did what's called a, a functional behavioral analysis to see what is the function of that behavior? Why is he doing it? And what we found out was for two years, he had an absence, an abscessed tooth and he was in so much pain, but he did he couldn't communicate. He was nonverbal and couldn't communicate, know how to communicate even beyond that. So once we figured that out, they went to the dentist, got to figure out, and he stopped engaging in those behaviors. So it's really understanding why people engage in a behavior and then increasing positive behaviors through reinforcement and basically um, extinguishing or ignoring the bad. By extinguishing, I mean ignoring, by the way. You just don't reinforce them at all. But not everyone can do this. There are people who are trained, in, they're called BCBAs, that have supervision and they, they learn how to do this and they're licensed in every state. So I wanna end, I have about five more minutes. I wanna end on just letting you know what, what we're very passionate about too, which is um, the families. And um, I think for me, this, this became the most significant. I, I used to work in a small town and had for a long time. And I was at the grocery store and you know, it's like when you go really late at the grocery store and you think no one's gonna run into you and you're not looking your best or professionalist. Yeah, I had sweats on, I think, and hadn't shaved or anything. And, and this woman walks up to me and she's like, oh my gosh, you're Dr. Canny. I'm like, I almost was gonna lie because I didn't want to admit who I was looking the way I did. But I said, yes, I'm Dr. Canny. She goes, I just wanted to say that I, I came to you 10 years ago and you helped my family and diagnosed my son with autism. And she goes, I remember every word you said that day. And it made a huge difference. Um, and I'm not saying this like to brag, what I'm saying is like, it's amazing to me that she remembered every word I said from 10 years ago. And the reason that's very significant to me is um, the, if you're on the other side of this, this is a huge thing. This could be a life changing event. This is your child you're talking about this, if you're a young adult being diagnosed, this is your life you're talking about. And so if you're diagnosed, I've had young adults like like not be mad at the diagnosis, but have it like, finally, I know, you know, I know what's going on. I know why, why I'm having difficulties in this area. So we're very big on how do we help support families in addition to the individual with autism? Because um, if you think about it, families who have children with autism have so many stresses. How do you you know, how do you attend to the other children if you're spending this much time, you know, focused on the child autism? How do you deal with tantrums? Um, you know, I had, a, again, my good friend, um, her child was like wrecking their home, like every night, severe tantrums, throwing stuff, punching in the walls. And it was just like, how do you deal with that every single night? You know, when they injure themselves, um, we had a, a kid who only slept for the first three years, two hours a night. Now, can you imagine that as a parent and then being terrified that they were going to a low bath. So the parents weren't getting any sleep. The other siblings weren't getting sleep. What about special diets? What about if they have a seizure? The biggest one though is how other people criticize because they don't understand. Um, you know, the, the people in Walmart that say, I pick on Walmart because this is actually a story where she's like, people would say, well, you just need to spank your child more. They won't behave like that. And then everyone and their, and their sister and brother want to give you advice. Like, well, it's not really autism. If you just do this, it will work. Well, you try, and so you're getting advice from everybody. So the, the, the parents and the families and the siblings, in addition to the individual with autism themselves, go through so much stress. They worry about what the future holds. If I, what happens when I'm not here anymore? Um, we know that parents of children with autism lose their friends. They have financial problems. We had people had to actually mortgage their home because they need to pay for some of the therapies. Um, how do you learn about IEPs and social security and how do you go to events? What are people going to think of them? So all of these stresses. So, you know, our goal when it comes to creating a center is really how do you make it patient centered? How do you make it comprehensive? How do you coordinate care? So like these kids need often neurology, they need developmental pediatrics, they need special diets, nutrition. So we want, how do you make it accessible for everybody and how do you keep it the high quality? Um, so this center that it, here at Cornell was, was started about 2013. And you'll, you'll, it's a beautiful campus we live on. And even what I love about our center is the architect themselves um, really tried to uh, reflect in the building our mission, which is how do you support the families and take care of them? So it's very child friendly. Um, there are people with autism that actually contributed to the design and talked about it. So um, it was very attentive to those. So let me stop sharing. And I did good. I have about 10 minutes left and we don't have to take up 10 minutes, but um, the q and I think should be open. If people uh, have questions they'd like to, to, to type into the question, the Q&A part, feel free. And I'm happy to answer whatever questions people might have. 
and Janet, I'll start with you. Do you have any questions about autism at all? Or uh, would it be bad to say that there are people I think might be somewhere in there? But that's that's you know I, I think that I, I have a I I I have a better appreciation just for the I guess the struggles, but you know the, what's behind you know some of the behaviors we might notice, and um, to me a lot more compassion for um, this people, families, and, and um, just when, not to, you know, to let go of judgment, because there is always um, a lot that that's going on. And I think the, um, I don't know, I found fascinating, I have to say, I really didn't know much at all. I actually have a uh, cousin whose son is autistic, and uh, in his 30s, and um, I don't see him very often. But, um, you know, I, I, don't know, I found it very fascinating and I just feel very nurtured by 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 you and just um, you know it sounds like you really um, are supporting the families and really care and I think that's um, that's so important and I I'm always amazed at the uh, the way research has advanced about the brain and everything over the years so there's always something changing and um, new research and uh, that can inform the way we support people. So thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm, I always, you know, find it interesting, like what, what we do diagnostically, we, we, our, our diagnosis tends to be incredibly accurate. We're very good. We have a lot of good tools right now to make a diagnosis of autism. And this is something I didn't mention in my talk um, that we can put out there because there's different myths about autism as well. And one of them is we can diagnose autism reliably by the age of two. And that's an incredibly solid, stable diagnosis. Um, but, you know, we can actually have tools to diagnose as young as 12 months of age if they show the proper symptoms. Um, the problem is a lot of kids that age are still developing and they don't show them. So we're not sure until they get to about two. So we have them come back to be sure. But there are kids who we are sure by that age that have autism. So we can, our tools are now and the training that we do is such that we can diagnose a lot earlier. So I'll use, Jane, I'll embarrass you and use you as an example, if you don't mind. So um, just to give you an example for people who are watching the webinar, kind of what we look for, notice right now she's doing a little half smile. So that's what we call a reciprocal smile that she realizes that, you know, we're talking about her and so she's having a reaction. Now, when I talked to her specifically, she would nod her head and she would use her hands. She cocked her head to the side. She used her eyebrows differently. So those are all what we call very subtle, but integrated communication. So she was integrating her verbal, her nonverbal all together. Her tone of her voice had great modulation to it. So not only did it have modulation, but her modulation reflected the semantic language that she was using and she engaged in perspective taking. So all in that small time that you just mentioned all that, so even that your reaction right there, eyebrows up and surprise and social smile. It makes Flash you face, flash on the face. So these are things that we, you know, it makes you nervous when we point them out, but there are things that we do, we all do, and we're, it's unconscious, right? So, you know, if I was working with someone to ask if they have autism, these are the things we pay attention to, but then what we do is more than that, because like, if you're that child, I see there's two questions, I'm going to get to those, don't worry. If I, if someone's just sitting there with an iPad, I don't know if they have autism or not, right? So what you have to do is engage with that, that child or that young adult. You have, to, you have to like press on their social world to elicit behaviors. And that's what we used in our very sophisticated tools to figure out if someone has autism or not. So we have one question that says, do different symptoms show different brain deficits? Good question. I think I would reverse that and say that certain brain deficits might exhibit different symptoms is the way I would think about it. Um, and you know, brain deficits, I, I don't necessarily like that word. I, I do know that we have if you have autism, we often have impact in the way you think. But there's been a lot of studies about that and we're still trying to figure it out. And there's nothing consistent. Um, so again, I, I know kids who are like a lot smarter than I am when it comes to their brain and figuring things out. Um, I know people, you know, are like people with autism who can't speak, they're nonverbal. Their nonverbal skills can actually be incredibly strong. So like they can figure things out spatially. Um, we do know that one of the, like I, I, one of my rules in life is that your greatest strength is probably your also your greatest weakness. Um, and I think that's true for everybody. And in autism is certainly true. So like if you're very object focused, so you're concerned with objects and details, you have an incredible strength um, with regard to how you see the world that way and can do incredible things with that. 
but the weakness is you're missing what's happening out here. So that's why you might be missing the social world and all these other things. So we do know that more severe forms of autism or um, severe genetic deficits that cause a behavioral endpoint of autism can be associated with different brain deficits, as you say, like cognitive impairment, intellectual disability. So kids who are functioning at a much lower level cognitively that need a lot, a lot of help and a lot of different work. And those are the symptoms they show would be similar to what you would see in kids who have intellectual disabilities otherwise. So the other question is, what are your thoughts about DBT for emotional regulation? Uh, it's a very, Tara, very sophisticated uh, question <laughs> with regard to DBT. Um, and what we find, and let me broaden it to not just DBT, but any type of, of therapy, whether it be talk therapy or C, you know, kind of behavioral therapy. Uh, DBT is dialectical behavioral therapy, for example, which is for a specific type of, of um, personality disorder. So what we find is the elements of those can certainly help in autism. Um, what we find is certain populations of, of or let me put it this way, certain people with autism that have certain strengths tend to do better with those types of therapies. So if they're very verbal, they understand verbal, if they can take other people's point of view and perspective, um, and if they can um, have intellectual capacity to understand it, then those, those techniques seem to work and work pretty well. The problem is you have the other parts of autism that can interfere with it, like rigid thinking and cognitive rigidity. Um, so sometimes, again, just like other like medications, biological medications, we find that they work, but they're not as efficacious as you study them in a general population, um, which is why I work, you know, a lot of research is being done to figure out what are specific types of supports and therapies we can give that address the core symptoms a little bit more strongly. So I hope that answers your question. Any other questions anyone has? I was just wondering um, with Asperger's, um, is that something that's generally diagnosed in those early years as well, or does that um, show up later? Oh, great question. Um, and actually there's, there's, there's a deeper question embedded within your question, <laughs> which is, so back when we made the switch to DSM-5, they actually removed Asperger's syndrome from an official diagnosis. Um, and by the way, this was a huge uproar in the community because a lot of people uh, who had Asperger's and was diagnosed with it felt like that was who they were and their identity. And how can you just take away the identity, right? And I, that wasn't the intention. The intention is to say that the definition of Asperger's, the way it was defined in the DSM was very poor. So um, depending on where you went, you might've gotten a diagnosis of high functioning autism versus Asperger's. Um, for most people, the defining feature was Length, um, then you might actually get a diagnosis of high functioning autism instead. Um, and what we find is people with Asperger's also have deficits in language. So the re like, I know this is in the weeds, but if you actually officially went strictly by the DSM, no one would be diagnosed with Asperger's. Um, and actually Asperger's first, he's a, a person who wrote about this and that's who the syndrome was named after. His original seven people wouldn't have been diagnosed with Asperger's by those criteria. So what they found is it's a useful um, kind of identification of a phenotype of autism. So we know people with Asperger's look like this typically, um, but it's not its own specific diagnosis that means something genetically or etiologically or biologically. I don't know if I answered your question, but kind of went down a different road with it. Yes, a <laughs> more. I was also curious just with um, say adolescents or, or teens that are diagnosed, um, whether there's a um, particular uh, presentation, behavioral or otherwise, that that is, um, I guess, uh, more generalized to that group, you know, to that diagnosis yeah. at that at that age. Yeah, and this would be a good question to end on because I, th I think we're almost out of time. So let me kind of wrap it up with that question. Um, so because of increased awareness out there, we're doing a much better job um, with pediatricians and parents and give it the plugs to moms. There was research that showed 80, over 80% 80 of the time when a mom was thinking there was something going on with their child, they were right. Um, so the lesson there is pediatricians listen to the moms. They know what they're talking about. Um, don't ignore them. Um, the opposite wasn't true. When the parents thought there was nothing wrong, there still, still might have been. But when they think there's something going on, there is. So we're much better because of awareness and, and working with pediatricians and families of getting kids in sooner if there's concerns. That being said, I'm always shocked by we still have a, a relatively high number of people that come in when they're older and have never been diagnosed before and clearly have autism. 
And there's two different reasons why that might be that we find in general. One is what we call masking, where meaning like there might be um, our, our diagnostic overshadowing, it's called, where you might have a kid who has something else going on that's more prominent, like an intellectual disability or severe social anxiety and depression. That is so prominent that you don't see the autism until that stuff is treated or they grow out of it, and then you see the autism. Another one is those kids who are just, they're very, you know, their symptoms aren't as severe. So um, they're highly verbal, they're very smart, um, they're in situations where it doesn't press on their social difficulties, but then they get to a certain point um, in adolescence where the social peer groups become very, very intense that now their symptoms are starting to show more. Um, and that's when they get diagnosed. So it's, it's usually one of those two that we see, but it happens more often than, than I thought it would, to be honest. So. Thank you. Yeah, I guess uh, the lesson is just, you know, to, uh, we need, <laughs> I, I trust moms, I'm a mom just uh, go with the hunch and, you know, reach out. And a lot of times the pediatrician, I imagine, is the first point of contact about any concerns. And um, yeah. I've um, been involved with the mental health field. So, um, you know, the co-occurring disorders, if you will, like if you want to call them disorders, I mean, that happens a lot. And I think a lot of people think, oh, this is a diagnosis. I'm, I'm good. But there's so many things intermingled in there that it's, you really have to tease them apart. Absolutely. Okay, I'm the chatty one tonight. So um, anyway, I wanted to thank you, Dr. Canny, and for all, to all of you for coming out tonight. We are we have recorded this program, so uh, in a few weeks it should be available on the Greenberg Public Library website. And uh, anyway, I look forward to uh, having you back again. And um, we have a number of programs coming up at the library. You can see uh what what's on what's scheduled at greenberglibrary.org events and uh thank you all again and well, thank you for having evening. me i really appreciate it I, I i thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with everyone